Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the Department of Sociology and Anthropology's colloquium series. I am Travers, a professor in the department, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Shireen Razak, who will be giving a talk entitled The Coloniality of White Rage, The, Pol the Police Shooting of L'Oreal Sinningi. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that SFU's three campuses occupy parts of the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Katsi, Coquitlam, Kwantlen, Semiamu, and Tuasin peoples. As an uninvited settler on this land, I believe justice requires its return or the payment of reparations. For those of you who need closed captioning, there is a, bu a button at the bottom of the screen that says live transcript. You can enable the closed captioning by selecting that button, then clicking the little up arrow on the button and selecting view full transcript. I also want to let you know that this talk is being recorded and will be available on our departmental website in the coming weeks. When it is available, we'll be sending out an email to all attendees. In a moment, Dr. Razak will deliver a talk of about an hour. This will be followed by a question period of about 20 minutes. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a button that says Q&A. You can ask questions at any time during the event by typing your question there. We won't answer them uh, until Dr. Razak has finished speaking, of course. We'll get to as many questions as we can, but please remember to use respectful language and keep your questions brief. I'd like to now introduce Nadira Alif, who will stop screen sharing, who is an MA student in sociology, and Nadira will be introducing Dr. Razak. Thank you, Travers. Um, today, I am really excited to introduce our guest speaker, post-colonial scholar and activist, uh, Dr. Shireen Razak. Um, you may have probably, or you probably are a fan of Dr. Razak's um, somewhere within the participants here, um, who's author of many books, including Looking White People in the Eye, Race, State, and the Law, uh, and The Killing of Pamela George. Dr. Razak is um, a feminist scholar of color who has examined state and social responses to gendered racialized violence. Her contributions to feminist and critical race studies um, cannot be measured uh, or even described easily. Um, her analytics shows how racial violence is often legal and uh, socially authorized and is central to the making of white settler nations, um, states, and how racial violence is gendered and sexualized. Um, you may have read, read some of her work uh, with Muslim women or Indigenous women in Canada and looking at systemic racism in the Canadian justice system um, and colonial violence against Indigenous people worldwide. Her scholarship helps us understand how racialized violence becomes everyday and what we can do about it, most importantly. Um, the myth mythology that is Canada uh, sees it as a country being founded by white uh, colonialists amid a population that were in need of civilization. Again, denying the violent um, ideology underpinning colonial laws and practices that we now have to live with. Um, and the first time I read uh, Dr. Razak was in 2000, not in 2000, yeah, in 2013, um, when she published uh, On Race and Deaths in Custody in the Canadian Justice System and wrote about a killing indifference uh, in the formal alliance between law and medicine uh, to describe how Indigenous and Black people's deaths in custody um, are manipulated and state violence is ignored. So that's enough uh, hearing about me. I'm very excited now to let Dr. Razak talk um, and I would encourage you to write down your questions. <laughs> Thank you, Nadira. Take it away, Dr. Razak. Okay. Oh dear. Trying to get my talk lined up. Okay, we'll have to do it this way. Um, Thank you very much for that introduction. And thanks to Travis for the invitation. Uh, I'm always really uh, glad to be talking to Canada and to Canadians. Uh, I do miss it. I'm now in the United States. Um, 
but I'm also uh, entirely preoccupied with sort of making connections between what you see here and what you see there. And so some of that uh, I would like to, to, uh, to talk about today. So uh, let me start with, um, sorry, I'm just gonna get myself out of this gallery view. Okay, can't do it. Okay, so uh, I want to begin a little bit um, belligerently, and I hope you'll forgive the, the little rant. Um, I want to mention a few things that I wrote in an op-ed last June. Um, I Primarily, I don't want to, I want to ask you not to indulge in the idea that the United States is so much worse than Canada in terms of its treatment of indigenous peoples. It's a, it's a very easy thing to do and perhaps easy right now, uh, especially, but I wanted to beg you to uh, not indulge in Canadian exceptionalism. So I, I in this op-ed that I wrote uh, in, in summer, uh, I, I noticed that the journal BC Studies expressed solidarity with Black Lives Matter and with anti-racist protesters around the world who were condemning the murders of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd. And the journal, uh, I was very struck by the journal putting it this way, the anti-Black racism that caused their premature deaths is a manifestation of the perversive structural racism arising from legacies of slavery and colonialism. So I was struck by the phrase legacies of slavery and colonialism because it felt as though uh, many in the world had really failed to internalize the meaning of that phrase, legacies of slavery and colonialism. Canadians are apt to think that they didn't have plantation slavery and that they're off the hook. How many times have we heard that Canada is the destination, was the destination of the Underground Railroad even more pervasive is the feeling that colonialism is in the past. And in any event, we settled the country peacefully, which was said by Michael Ignatieff when he was prime minister. We were vaguely, you know, merely misguided about residential schools that was said by former prime minister Harper. We had a TRC, we even had an inquiry into missing and murdered indigenous women. And we've begun to tackle the problem of systemic racism in the police. The present prime minister has said that, even though it was fairly obvious at the time that the commissioner of the RCMP was herself unsure what the concept of systemic racism actually meant. So Canadians have regularly oscillated between showing concern and a commitment to reform in one moment, and then in the other moment, indulging themselves in this kind of exceptionalism. And in the midst of all of that, indigenous black and brown deaths have continued apace. Most recently uh, in the summer, Chantal Moore, uh, an indigenous uh, woman was shot by New Brunswick police in June. 16 year old Esha Hudson was shot by police in Winnipeg. She was just coming out of a liquor store. And I've just learned that the officer will not be charged. As with all such shootings, both in Canada and the US, the police and legal narratives of choice is a very simple one. I felt a fear and a threat, and I had no option but to shoot. This is the narrative that I'll be talking about today. As the Black Lives Matter movement has so clearly shown, policing of the colonial kind has run its course. It's the end. It's time to end the story. If the call for police and prison abolition alarms you, if you can't see the options, think about what policing is currently about. Think about the rates of indigenous and black deaths in custody. Most of all, think about why we should never be able to say we didn't know it was happening. As a critical race scholar and the author of a book on indigenous deaths in custody, I've received my share of comments from readers expressing disbelief that policing is as violent as it is. 
Ironically, critics often pepper their objections with open as well as coded expressions of racism for which Canadians like Americans are well known. Go back to where you came from, your people engaged in slavery too. Surely you don't believe that a country that has been so kind to you engages in this kind of practice. As a Canadian of Caribbean origin, who is now living in the United States, I've grown tired of the haters and have little patience for the smugness of Canadians who believe that they're so much less racist and extreme than Americans. So hence this rant. <laughs> so as we contemplate abolition, which is what I hope we will contemplate, I speak now to remind you, my fellow Canadians actually, of the following. In Vancouver, Frank Paul, a Mi'kmaq man who was unable to walk the night he died and who was dragged by police to an alley on a cold, wet night and left to die. I want to remind you of Paul Alphonse, a Sequemet man who died in a Williams Lake hospital in police custody with the print of a boot on his chest and several ribs broken. I could remind you also of a host of indigenous men and women from BC and Saskatchewan, which happened to be the two provinces that I studied, who were arrested for drunkenness, died in a jail cell, calling out for help that never came. I can also remind you of Anthony Dawson, a member of uh, the Musqueam Nation who died in Victoria, unable to breathe after he was restrained, hogtied, and transported to police to hospital face down, likely after a 300 pound police officer sat on him. Dawson died in a very similar way to the way that Eric Ghana died. Did Dawson utter those words, I can't breathe? We don't know, but the only thing I know is that Dawson's death and the deaths of so many Indigenous and Black Canadians did not bring Canadians out to protest on the streets. In fact, our legal process of choice, which is the inquest and its cousin, the inquiry, typically blames those who died in police custody for their own deaths. Dawson, like Floyd and Garner in the US, was considered to be suffering the spurious disease of excited delirium. An inquest concluded that Dawson's death was accidental and brought on by delirium and so on it goes. It's a population that's dying anyway, that's what the law tells us. So if I begin this way, it is to uh, emphasize Black Lives Matter, Indigenous Lives Matter, as we protest and demand change, as we understand that the problem is deeply structural and connected to an ongoing white settler colonialism and the pervasive racism that colonial enslaved nations require for their life's blood, let's pause and think of these deaths and don't slip into an easy Canadian innocence and outrage about American police killings, but not about Canadian ones. Let's not say we didn't know. So I, I wanted to open with that and I apologize if it sounds a bit like a rant, um, but I want to open with it because the case that I will be discussing today is an American one. And every time I, I talk about this, I think to myself, is the audience thinking how this would have unfolded if it were Vancouver, British Columbia, if it were Victoria, if it were Regina, and not in fact uh, in, in Winslow, Arizona. So I want to really invite you to, to think that way as I, I talk about this. So on, on March 27, 2014, not very long ago, L'Oreal Sinigani, a 27-year-old Navajo woman, was shot and killed by Austin Shipley, a white police officer who was also 27 years old, who said he was trying to apprehend her for a suspected shoplifting. In Shipley's account, Sinigani came at me, those are his words, with the scissors. I felt a fear and a threat and I did what I had to do. Since Shipley was never charged, 
and the Department of Justice declined to investigate the Winslow police on the matter, concluding that there was insufficient evidence to disprove Officer Shipley's claim that he shot Sinigani in self-defense, Shipley's three-step account became the scaffold of the official story. It's a prototypical police narrative and it's virtually identical to police accounts justifying the shootings of black men and women and of indigenous men and women. Shipley's account depends on Sinigani being reconstructed after the event as an unstoppable force of nature, an animal provoked. Since police encounters, shooting encounters, typically take place in less than a minute, and in the case of Sinigani, in under 22 seconds, police accounts legitimating the use of force emphasize threat, and in ways that cast the person who is killed in superhuman and subhuman terms. Inescapably racial, the scenario of a hundred pound young woman holding a pair of inch long medical scissors, an object plainly visible to the 200 pound police officer gripping her wrists after he's wrestled her to the ground is scripted in the law as a story of a crazed woman wielding a lethal weapon, a force that only bullets can stop. So I'd like to explore Shipley's killing of L'Oreal Sinigani and the ensuing police investigation as a violence that lies at the heart of settler colonialism. I maintain that police shootings of indigenous people and the legal response to police use of force, along with everyday settler violence, are a part of the racial terror that is a central part of settler colonialism. Both the shooting and the official narratives of it as a justifiable use of force reveal the psychic and the material underpinnings of a settler state, a state that continually imagines and consolidates itself as a community of whites imperiled by Indians, among others. White settler violence directed at indigenous people lies just beneath the surface of everyday life and importantly flows through institutions such as police embedding itself in everyday professional routines. The extractive relations that are the basis of settler colonialism require and produce white subjects for whom indigenous lands and bodies are the resource for white identity. Policing is one site where white men and women, as well as those aspiring to whiteness, can enact racial hierarchy on behalf of the colonial state with impunity. So let me give my argument up front. I have this tendency to rush things through at the end when I realize it's gone on too long. So I want to, to give the argument up front. I emphasize that settler colonialism is an ongoing racial project of accumulation and one that is structured by indigenous dispossession and slavery. Settler colonial, settler colonial regimes require the daily exercise of racial terror, not only because dispossessed and enslaved peoples must be, or formerly enslaved peoples uh, must be kept in line, their communities weakened, but also because the white settler subject is an anxious subject who is compelled to assert himself or herself in encounters with racial others. Racial terror is productive, reassuring the settler subject that white entitlement is protected and the racial threat contained. Settler colonialism's economic processes require and produce subjects who understand their own racial superiority in gendered ways through violence, a process memorably described by Richard Slotkin as regeneration through violence. We, we see more readily the macro aspects of the colonial project, resource extraction, ongoing land theft, and so on. And we pay less attention to what I'd like to think of as the everyday extractive relationships. The way that is in which indigenous bodies, violated, neglected, annihilated, become the raw material for the making of the settler subject. 
In those spaces where settlers must engage, must manage daily encounters with Indians, as in the case of the towns bordering reservations in the United States, such as Winslow, Arizona, where Sinigani was shot, settlers and police assert their right to the land through anti-Indigenous violence. If the extractive relationships that are the basis of settler colonialism require and produce white subjects for whom Indigenous lands and bodies are the resource for white identity, policing is one side where white men and women and those aspiring to whiteness can enact and consolidate racial hierarchy. I want to consider Shipley's account of the shooting and the official response to his, his account uh, rather closely in terms of the racial and colonial lines of force they construct and the masculine colonial subjectivity they reveal. Notwithstanding the fact that the encounter is very choreographed in the police narrative, I want to suggest that we actually take Officer Shipley at his word. The fear of Indians and the threat that they are imagined to pose underwrite a white colonial masculinity that seeks confirmation of dominance and that is easily unhinged in the hysteria of the colonial encounter. Policing the reservation border town, which is what they're called in the United States, sets the stage for such gendered colonial dramas to unfold and for their deadly consequences to ensue. Official investigations of such events confirm the racial logic embedded in the narrative. I felt a fear and a threat and I did what I had to do. Racial violence, whether on the part of individual settlers or police, is a feature of daily life in regimes based on white entitlement to land and property, and is therefore integral to settler society. Leslie Thielen Wilson reminds us of Fanon's observation in Wretched of the Earth, that the settler's violence lies just under the skin. Unpacking three Canadian cases where white men killed Indigenous people in Canada, who were perceived as encroaching on white settler spaces, Thielen Wilson argues that property produces racialized feeling, feelings that are at the heart of settler subjectivity. Okay, now, let me begin, but first I should say that police killings of indigenous people garner little attention in spite of the fact that proportionally in the United States, more Native Americans and African Americans are killed by police than any other group. Indigenous in, in the invisibility as racial target suggests a settler colonial dynamic at play where all the Indians are presumed dead or dying and the land and resources are considered already belonging to settlers. So indigenous peoples are ghosted while still alive and their lives not only count for less, but that are not even counted. It's an invisibility that is essential to the story of settlers as the presumed original citizens who have rightfully replaced the region's pre-modern inhabitants. So the, what, what do we do with our insistent disappearing of indigenous peoples? I like to quote Renee Berglund in her marvelous study of, of Indian ghosts in American literature, where she reminds us that ghosts are the things that we try to bury and that refuse to stay buried. They are our fears and horrors. What to do with fear, memory, and desire, the very things that hegemonies are made of, as Berglund suggests. How to contend with white feelings of fear and threat when these feelings constitute a circulating colonial affect that solidifies as a nationalism that is intrinsically white. How to deal with ghosts that refuse to stay buried. Mythology notwithstanding, indigenous people have not disappeared. And in places such as Winslow, Arizona, they are close to 25% of the population 
Adjacent to a large Navajo reservation, indigenous presence in Winslow is often greater than the census acknowledges. Officer Shipley, as I suggest, is a man haunted by Indians, a man whose masculinity gains a firm footing through violence against Indians and particularly against young Indian women. Violence dissolves the threat that both ghosts and live Indians pose. It serves to convince the settler of his legitimacy. An Indian fighter, an old term, turned cop, Shipley enjoyed the protection of the Winslow Police Force and the Department of Justice. His account of the shooting, one that is carefully choreographed by the police, contributes to a collective and sanctioned white terror. It's useful, I think, to, to think of policing as racial infrastructure. That is, it's a part of the material systems that organize primitive accumulation. It's a part of, and the racial hierarchy on which it depends. In that sense, colonial policing is really state organized Indian fighting. In keeping with Melanie Yazzie's reminder that police in towns such as Winslow assist white settlers to contain the Indian threat, we can consider policing in Winslow as part of the infrastructural ground on which settlers quests both for coherence and land are played out. What first marks the scene of the shooting as fully colonial and racial is the familiar signpost of colonial policing. That is policing organized around maintaining the racial lines a force of the settler town. These are the same racial lines that Fanon talked about. Patrolling the streets of the settler town, as I've shown in, in, in Dying from Improvement, maintains public space for white inhabitants, and it produces indigenous people as permanently out of place, herded, hunted, evicted, and marked for slow death. The police, it should be remembered, knew that they were looking for, quote, an Indian woman shoplifter on a beer run. That was the phrase announced over the police radio that day. And one that Shipley revealed as part of his everyday lexicon when he unselfconsciously categorized Sinigani as killing me for a beer run. If we take Shipley at his word that he felt a fear and a threat, we can note the infrastructure of policing and which such scenarios of imperiled white masculinity are played out. The streets and the prison are two sites where the contours of the racial order are written on the bodies of indigenous women and men and in very specific ways on the bodies of indigenous children and youth. In a reservation border town, such as Winslow, policing is barely altered from its 19th century form. It has its primary objective, the disciplining and surveillance of Indians and their eviction from the settler town. Shipley's daily life as a police officer reveals as much. Now, the ongoing theft of land and the racial terror that accompanies it are very easily traced for Winslow and surrounding areas. And as I tell you these details, thinking in your head, what would these details look like if I were talking about Vancouver? So uh, in uh, Wasichu, the continuing Indian wars, Bruce Johansson and Roberto Mesas writes of the theft of land, life and resources. They recount in detail the institutional, cultural, and physical violence directed against Navajo people for centuries. They document, for example, the acres of land stolen, how many? The intensified resource extraction on Indian lands right up until the 1970s and continuing when coal and uranium formed the basis of an energy policy that required even more indigenous land than before. They recount the targeting of indigenous leaders and activists and an escalating racial terror. When you add up all these things, you find the details of racial terror. 
Between 1973 and 1974, for example, the bodies of 10 Navajo uh, uh, men were discovered, middle-aged men who were sexually mutilated and tortured. Three non-juvenile whites were arrested for the crime, tried and sent to a juvenile, three, three, three non-Indian juveniles were, were arrested. They were sent to a reformatory for two years. That's it. These were called the mutilation murders of the 1970s. And it's important to, to repeat sort of uh, John Redhouse's words. He was the associate director of, of the National Indian Youth Council of Albuquerque, New Mexico. And he said, Indian activists understood clearly that the violence was not simply the act of crazy kids, but was in fact part of a whole racist picture. And they describe the tapestry of racial violence. And, and, and when I list this tapestry, think again of Vancouver, the activities of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the justice system, the public health system, the multinational energy companies, plus everyday encounters with white settlers, the removal of Indian children from their families, the sterilization of Indian women, the denigration of Indian children in the school systems, the insidious effects of a colonial police force. The mechanisms that by the middle of the 1970s enabled 63% of Indian owned agricultural in, uh, land to be cultivated by non-Indians. I think we should follow these numbers very closely, leaving little doubt that the full on colonial project is in operation. The epicenter of these patterns is really, oh my goodness. I am sorry for that. <laughs> oh dear. Okay. I turned it off. My God. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, I can't find it. I'm just okay. Isn't that awful? I'm so sorry. Okay, so oh, okay. the border town is a place where you can get away with anything against Indians. And, I, you know, when we focus on this border town and the actual specific history of Winslow, Arizona, what we see is a very clear example of the racial infrastructure on which settler colonialism rests and the racial groupness that it requires. Diné historian Jennifer Dennett-Dale, who examines the historical and lived experience of indigenous peoples in border towns and the tremendous racial violence that is reported to the Navajo Human Rights Commission, traces the border town as a place where white settlers profit off of Indian trade very early on, expanding alcohol sales to Indians coming into town to purchase supplies, then the continuous erosion of Navajo land drives many Indians into the border town, as a survey in 1953 showed. Then, as now, the spatial arrangements of settler colonialism, arrangements that emerged with land dispossession, and that Cheryl Redhouse Bennett describes as predatory, really are really generate and require considerable racial violence. Lisa Donaldson had shown, for example, that the practice of Indian rolling, racially motivated assaults committed by white youth, requires considerable, the, the, is, a, is a rite of passage for white youth, and it's a practice with deep historical roots. You might think of Indian rolling in connection with uh, Canadian equivalents of that, such as starlight tours. Donaldson suggests that this degree of racial violence results from a situation where whites have total economic and political power over Indians. In the same way, Barbara T Perry has explored the extent of hate crime. Americans are more likely to use the term hate crime than Canadians are in reservation border towns. Perry said the very motive and intent of racialized violence is to protect carefully crafted boundaries in the physical and in the social sense. It is a purposive process of policing the lines between white and indigenous, between dominant and subordinate, 
It stands then as both punishment for those who dare to transgress and lessons for those who are considering it. Indian rolling, for example, and starlight tours in Canada uh, really declare the lines of force. Although research is, is sparse into, into reservation border towns, there are a few things that we know about it. And one of the things that we know about it is that it is white men's violence, both police and settler, directed at indigenous men and women alike. For example, uh, police Killings of Native Americans is greatest in border towns such as in New Mexico near the Navajo Reservation or in South Dakota near Sioux Reservations and in Montana near the Crow and Northern Cheyenne Reservations. And these kinds of killings have a range with which you will be familiar. The shooting of a Squamish woman, Janetta Riley, pregnant, homeless and mentally ill who threatened suicide and who was shot when she refused to drop the knife she held to herself to Sarah Lee Circlebeer, who died in her cell after telling her jailers that she was, in excruciate, she was in excruciating pain. This is a grim picture. And I think it is that uh, grim picture that we have to keep in mind in terms of its 100 year old or 200 year old pattern. For example, tribal elder Bennett described the, the pattern of railway death, railroad deaths a hundred years ago. Fishing and trapping were outlawed, so the men went out at night, making the cabins very dangerous. White men would come in, kick the doors in, rape and murder the women, and now we have railroad accident deaths. This might not sound familiar to us because we haven't been tracking this closely for Canada. Racial violence that emerges in the context of white claims for land and resources has remained constant right up until the present. For example, Tracy Britton has charted how sexual violence against indigenous women skyrocket with the influx of white miners in reservation border towns. Beware of resource extraction and all that it brings in its wake. American Indian women like Canadian Indigenous women have the highest rate of violence perpetrated against them. It, Amnesty International, for example, has reported widespread police harassment and shootings and young white, they've reported that young white men regularly cruise to target Indigenous women in border towns. We could provide exactly the same picture if we, uh, and I have in some of my work, if you, if you uh, want to look it look it up. So this, you know, cruising of indigenous women in border towns is targeting goes on by police and settler alike. And of course, uh, a lot of the violence occurs in prostitution, a violence that indigenous sex workers describe as a, a violence that is specifically aimed at Indian women. So Although Native Americans account for 25% of Winslow's population, they average 65% of the arrests. And Indigenous youth and women have a very particular place in these statistics. If sexual violence from white men and police is not empirically validated for Winslow specifically, because no one's done any kind of studies, the Navajo community expresses tremendous fear for its girls and women when they venture out into Winslow. In fact, at one Navajo public forum at, at which I was a panelist, a very uncharitable commentator suggested that we, Sinigani should never have gone to live in Winslow since she should have known what the town is like for young Indian women. Another speaker, speculated that Sinigini might have been one of the women the police routinely take outside of the city to rape. For me as a panelist and an outsider hearing these casual details, uh, you feel absolutely impelled to connect it to the data that you are in fact gathering at hand. It's very hard in these informal conversations to confirm sexual violence and to delineate the role of the police. But it is clear, as Indigenous scholars have said, such as my colleague Shannon Speed, 
she has argued internal violence within indigenous communities is linked to state violence in very complex ways. Sinigani lived in Winslow and in that environment, she had a great deal of police contact, contact that sometimes occurred when she encountered sexual assaults from both indigenous and uh, racialized men. Shipley, for example, was the police officer who responded to a call about domestic violence involving Sinigani, an event he claimed not to recall. He encountered a naked and evidently frightened Sinigani fleeing her abusive boyfriend. Reading police reports of these events, one readily sees ongoing displacement and its consequences in Sinigani's life the role of sexual violence and both indigenous and police involvement in it. The violence in her life came from all directions and the shared difficulty of surviving and thriving in a system that is actually premised on her destruction is evident in her short life. It is critical to consider the violence that is written on indigenous women's and men's bodies as multi-scalar, as a multi-scalar imprinting of colonial power. My colleague Mishwana Goman emphasizes that in order to understand the role of gender-based violence in reproducing colonialism, it is essential that we consider the body as it journeys through temporalities and spaces. Extensive physical and sexual abuse at the hands of colonizing men and the violence within their own communities all connect to sustain an unfolding colonialism. We shouldn't lose sight of the mutually constitutive nature of gender violence and colonial violence. Domestic violence, for instance, is in part generated by state violence. White men are an important link in the chain of events that results in excessive violence in the lives of indigenous women. The police files detail Shipley's encounters with Indians and they record the traces of the fear, memory and desire to which Berglund refers. The colonial underpinnings of Shipley's encounter are visible, uh, his encounter with L'Oreal Sinigany are visible from the outset. If L'Oreal Sinigani arrived at the encounter already scripted as an Indian on a beer run, Shipley came to it as a white man drawn to guns and to Indians. He enters the scene as a prototypical Indian fighter, imagining himself at risk from a wild Indian. At first glance, it's tempting to attribute Shipley's relationship to Indians to white extremism. And it's even more tempting uh, when you think of recent events in the storming of Capitol Hill here. Shipley was photographed at an earlier event wearing a t-shirt of the three percenters, a movement organized around patriotism and the idea of a constitutional right to bear arms. The, this group was front and center in the assault on the Capitol. Shipley can be seen as someone whose allegiances are to what Kathleen Ballou has described as the white power movement and paramilitary America. Ballou is careful to note the expansive and contradictory category denoted by the term white power movement, a movement that brings together a whole host of people. Importantly, as an insightful reviewer of my work on, on, on L'Oreal Sinigini pointed out, Shipley does not have to be a member of a white nationalist right-wing group in order to fulfill the colonial role I'm suggesting he's playing. He played. His allegiance to the three percenters simply confirms the colonial features of his character. We could reflect here, of course, on the historical origin of the right to bear arms and the concomitant movement against big government to note the colonial underpinnings of such beliefs. As Dunbar Ortiz has shown, the right to bear arms gave settlers the right to attack Indians and take their land. That's where the idea comes from. Settler insistence on the right to overthrow oppressive governments grew out of settler resistance to British authorities who sought to regulate the extent to which settlers could seize Indian land. In British Columbia, it's really good to look at the, the history of, of, of uh, 
land here and see uh, the, the multiple players. You have the authorities trying to keep the settlers in line for their own purposes, but there's a, a full-scale land grab going on by the state and by settlers. The three percenter movement may be an illustration of this continuing land grab. Uh, and as I said, they, they were prominent in the, the insurrection on Capitol Hill. They were also prominent in the Charlottesville uh, riot. Suffice it to say that a land race arms nexus lies at the core of this white nationalism. And there is very little doubt that Shipley found himself comfortable with its chief tenets. He had a devotion to guns. He had excessive guns on his, his, his person. Uh, and, and these don't come up very formally in any uh, interrogation that there is. Shipley would seem to personify the unexceptional white subject for whom the Indian remains the archetype of all of those people, black people, brown people, racialized foreigners who are imagined as a threat to white settler entitlement. Rather than extremist, the Indian fighter and the Indian fighter turned cop should be seen as foundational figures in the national imaginary, inhabiting and structuring the institution of policing, among other places. Shipley's record as a police officer offer glimpses of frustrated colonial desire and the violence that it inspires. The figure that Richard Slotkin describes as the, the subject for whom Indians lurk everywhere in society and in the recesses of one's own mind. Here one thinks of Shipley's service record, revealing his interest, if not his obsession, in power of indigenous people and particularly indigenous youth and girls. Equipped with extra guns, an illegal practice for which he was never sanctioned, Shipley indulged, could indulge himself with impunity in a 21st century of Indian wars. Struggling to maintain his coherence as a colonial subject, he preserves it through violence. In his three years as a police officer, his record hints at a volatility that easily led to an undue use of force. Shipley was first disciplined, for example, when the mother of a 15-year-old complained that he slammed her into a squad car and made a rude, ugly comment. The girl apparently taunted Shipley by referring to him as a rookie. Shipley acknowledged responding harshly and was suspended, but the department did not find any evidence of excessive force. In another event, he used a taser on a teenage girl, arguing that he felt threatened by her friends and thought that maybe she had a weapon. The girl in question refused to obey his order to sit at the curb. Finding no evidence of a weapon in the video, of the cop camera that Shipley wore, the department merely gave him a one day suspension. This is all such a familiar story and yet it requires uh, stating because it happens again and again. In fact, you see a, a, a funny moment on the, the video of the cop camera where one young uh, indigenous man says to Shipley, dude, you don't have to do this, she's just a girl. And you can get a sense of what's going on in that encounter. To place this imperiled whiteness and masculinity within a more collective context, we can consider what daily policing entails in Winslow, the relentless cycle of evicting indigenous people from the town. If Shipley's service record offers evidence that he was a haunted man, an aggressive police officer who was easily provoked, And uh, it, it also confirms that his violence was sanctioned. He never had to pay a price for it. There were 12 other instances where he was required to use force on, where he, he, he used force on suspects and nothing happened. In fact, he was required to complete diversity training. Let us be wary of that. Um, uh, but you know, nothing, nothing ensued from this. When the violence finally ended, uh, with the loss of Sinigani's life, the department offered its assistance in constructing the legal basis for his exoneration. And there are lots of details of, of, of how they actually did this. But let me go to the encounter 
So the storyline that Shipley offers is that he is a police officer who is guided by rational aims, acting professionally to contain a threat, manifest or latent, in any Indian who crosses his path. The visual record of the shooting, which is available from his body camera, and you will frequently hear uh, everyone placing their hopes in body cameras. Well, this example is an example of what exactly happens when we have body cameras of shootings. The narratives that are told exonerate the police officer. So how does this happen? It was a mere 22 seconds from the time Officer Shipley made contact with L'Oreal Sinigani to the time he fired his gun five times and killed her. Police typically defend shootings with recourse to a codified narrative about use of force. One that typically invokes the phrase edged weapons whenever you see those phrases and the 21 foot rule and a newly emerging discourse about persons in mental health crisis. I've actually tried to track these in different deaths in custody. If you want to check out uh, my website on, on race and deaths in custody, you can get it from looking at the racial violence hub, but you see that these are the words that are in all the cases in the US and in Canada. And they concern black people being shot, indigenous people being shot, everyone. Same police narrative, edged weapons, 21 foot rule, etc. Now scholars have noted, long noted, the importance of race to police narratives about deadly force. For instance, the iconic moment 25 years ago, the beating of Rodney King by 10 police officers was captured on a bystander's uh, video. And as Judith uh, Butler described in, in 1993, white paranoia transforms the blows of the police officers into King's blows, blows he never delivered, but which he is by virtue of his blackness, always about to deliver. In his analysis of the video of the King beating, Alan Feldman adds that increasing objectification increases our capacity to inflict pain and crucially to render the other's pain as inadmissible. So to achieve the transformation where Rodney King's body could be processed as a racial, a disciplinary and a legal object, his body had to be rendered pre-social. That is to say, the police were merely taming and caging King, achieving the neutering of the animalized body. King is rendered bestial to the point that he could not feel. The police reenact their violence in court, performing King's body as a spectrum of aggressive movements. It's easy to spot the police coding schemes that Butler and Feldman described with respect to Rodney King in the police narration of Sinigani. The 22 seconds that elapses between the time he first encounters Sinigani and when he fires five bullets is narrated second by second and each second becomes an event that conveys professional action on the part of the police. Police language, of course, assists with this endeavor. And so you hear things like, uh, Sinigani appeared to be a Native American female with black hair. I have been asked by audiences, how did the police know she was a Native American female? And my answer to that is, uh, there could be no other possibility in that space. Anybody in that space uh, would be racialized that way. And so it, you, you find the police narrative second by second narrating this, this uh, shooting and they uh, narrated to the point that Sinigani is merely this unstoppable force who keeps on walking. She lunges at him. Those are the words uh, when he fires his, his, his weapon, even after she's shot five times, she continues to be described in the police narrative as an advancing threat. Sinigani is described as holding her body off the ground with her right hand a position she holds for two seconds after being shot for five, five times. Each time the police narrative emphasizes she still held her body up. 
I don't encourage you to go and see the video on, online. It is available and it's, it's terribly distressing. And what do we do when we consume these videos? But suffice it to say, the police narrative renders Sinigini as a force that will not stop coming, even after five bullets. She is a threat subsiding. She is reduced, as, as Butler put it, of Rodney King to being a phantasm of white racist aggression. We should remember that colonialism is structured by unconscious sexualized processes where fantasy and desire play a fundamental role. The colonial subject is constituted through an encounter with the racial cultural other, becoming through an active denial of the other's difference disturbed and haunted by masculine dreams of possession. Shipley narrates himself as a police professional confronted by wild Indians. He describes the irrational savage maddened with fury. The narrative force of the interview really that the police do with Shipley derives from the presentation of Shipley's professional behavior and Sinigini's irrationality. So he says things like, I gave verbal commands. I tried to put her hands behind her. I tried to get on her stomach. I used the soft hold technique. I didn't want to hurt her. 22 seconds of this. The seconds go by in slow motion. He describes that he kept the 21 foot rule in mind. He describes uh, in police language, everything that he does. Sinigani is described as resisting, as aggressively walking, as having a blank demeanor, suggestive of someone who's mentally ill. Sinigani's behavior is so incomprehensible. Shipley then narrates in his interrogation why does this woman have scissors, nail scissors that she used to clip the ends of her hair? Why does she have scissors? Why was she trying to kill me? But apparently traumatized by the event, it is Shipley that the police narrative insists for whom we should feel sorry. So Colin Diane, a, a, a wonderful scholar has powerfully argued that white vulnerability to black savagery is a baseline narrative in the law, whether with respect to police shootings or to cruel and unusual punishment. This is also the narrative that fuels gun culture and that gives rise to the American fondness for the Second Amendment's right to bear arms. Commenting on Diane's book, Angela Davis observes that the logic of the prisoner as less than human really shows us how the ghosts of slavery animate institutions. I believe that what I'm seeing when I read the police reports on the killing of L'Oreal Sinigani is how the ghosts of settler colonialism animates institutions. If we see the afterlives of slavery and settler colonialism in prisons and in police shootings, both in their frequency and in police impunity. How should we understand the police shooting of a young Navajo woman and the legal narratives that justify it? <coughs> Excuse me. Settler colonialism is an ongoing process. It disposition, dispossession continues apace. We can expect then that the ghost of settler colonialism would animate institutions such as prisons and policing. There is abundantly in evidence in the reservation border town where policing entails the eviction of the native from the settler town, a perpetual drawing of the lines of power. In the settler psyche, white, wild Indians are everywhere and can only be controlled by force. The story in police shootings, I did what I had to do, I felt a, a fear and a threat, is one that is powered by race. It's given its coherency and logic by race. I want to end this by giving the last word to L'Oreal Sinigani. In the 22 seconds of the police encounter that is captured on the cop camera, one of the first things that I imagine I see 
in Sinigani's face is fear. The last thing I think I see is defiance, perhaps even the blank stare that Shipley describes is really evidence of defiance. Initially walking away from Shipley, who pursues her and throws her to the ground, she stands up and she walks towards him. Determination in her stride. I think of this moment as one that shares the sentiment of the hashtag, if they gun me down, which picture would they use? The inevitability of the moment, the end that those who are racially targeted anticipate finally comes. Is this refusal a final bringing to an end of a life of endless confrontation, a defiant inhabiting of the category of disposable? Even as I imagine refusal, I think about my own stakes in the story. The sources that I mine for the police narratives do not easily give up insights about L'Oreal Sinigani's humanity or her suffering, but they do reveal the contours of a colonial encounter, one that is structured by violence and terror. Yet I betray L'Oreal Sinigani if I don't find ways to resurrect the person who was killed, the person who struggled with racial terror and who may have found this last moment to confront it. Constructed by the police as animalistic threat who rises up after five bullets to confront a police officer, I want to rewrite this narrative, leaving an image not of superhuman aggression, but of an insistence on being recognized and perhaps a taunt and a despair. I am still here. I'm very happy to take questions about this and to discuss how it might, how we might Canadianize the story if people would like to do that. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Razak. Just let's pause for a moment and imagine wild, enthusiastic applause. It's something we haven't managed to replicate in webinar environments. I want to thank you so much for your powerful talk. One of the reasons that your scholarship has had such an impact on my own work is your refusal to let us look away from the violence that underlies you know, the, the way that we live in Canada and the way that people live in the United States. It's uh, a model of scholarship that is really important and your meticulous research to, you know, to make this visible is, is just outstanding and you've done it again with this case. Um, what I'm going to do is ask Nadira to check into the Q&A. For those of you who'd like to raise a question, there's a Q&A at the bottom of your screen. You can ask a question and Nadira and I will take turns choosing a question and uh, read it to Dr. Razak and she will answer. Okay, um, I've got a question here from Gabriella. Thank you for your talk. This was very informative and I really enjoyed it. I'm just wondering why we talk about instances like these as um, specters of colonialism and not as continuing colonialism. I, I think that uh, it is difficult to, to, to talk about the ghosts of settler colonialism uh, because it implies uh, that colonialism has ended. But when I talk about the ghosts, I, I'm really uh, talking about uh, the Indians who are in the settler's mind as threat, as, as, as spectral threats. So I'm not actually talking about real Indians. I'm talking about Indians in their minds that haunt them. Shipley is riding around town endlessly haunted by these images in his head of wild Indians who are out to get him. Those are not real Indians. Those are spectral Indians. So that's what, what I mean by that. I, I use ghosts or phantoms or spectral Indians um, to, to mainly uh, talk about that psychic process that I'm so interested in that leads to the violence. Thank you. One of the questions that uh, Nadira and I both have, because we were talking about this before, we are very curious about um, the 
the Proud Boys who had their origin in Canada and the links that you make to ongoing settler colonialism, ongoing anti-Black racism. And I imagine from your time in the United States that you have a particular vantage point. Uh, about the Proud, Proud Boys and the, you know, you know where they came to my attention is interesting. I'm just, just finishing a book on uh, Muslims and uh, I've been tracing anti-Muslim racism in the law. And there are all of these sort of local conflicts that I trace, for example, uh, parents uh, getting really upset that there's any teaching about Islam in the school curriculum and wanting to get it banned. Um, and this has resulted in, in, in uh, events where, you know, uh, white men threaten to shoot up the school because the school is teaching about Islam in the school curriculum. And in my sort of research and all of these kinds of conflicts, repeatedly, I saw this coming together of people like the Proud Boys, uh, the Three Percenters, various other groups of the same ilk appearing at the school. Usually the, the, this happens, you know, at, at uh, school meetings, but also joining, uh, you know, all kinds of efforts to, to protest, to have uh, uh, law, legal, legal battles around this, which are supported by all these organizations. Um, so that's where this this kind of white extremist came to my attention was actually through um, Muslims, because it happened that I'd been spending a bit of time on that rather than indigenous violence. So I actually felt a bit of um, a recognition because the Sinigini case was something I had been asked to um, to write, think about for by the Navajo Human Rights Commission and. Uh, uh, I, you know, was quite, I felt like if I knew all of these characters in these organizations, and then right after I knew that events started happening where they were showing up on the national scene. Um, Charlottesville, you know, the insurrection, etc. But what what I want to sort of emphasize about this is, uh, first of all, it's extremists getting together with a whole bunch of people who don't have that label. So we really have to think about when we isolate it to a proud boy phenomenon or a three percenter phenomenon. And the second thing I want to say is they're after everybody, indigenous, black and brown. Um, and they have a whole bunch of other, you know, sexual minorities that, you know, there's a full sort of, you know, um, roster of people. But this all comes together in a white, consciousness of entitlement that is threatened. And as I said at the beginning, it's an anxious subject and the anxiety is resolved through violence. And this I feel is very familiar to me. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Nadira, do you have a, another question to pose? Yeah, I do, There's, they're coming in now. Um, we have, okay, so what advice would you offer emerging scholars who want to use the legal archive in their research, but who do not possess a background in law? Ah, well, I don't possess a background in law. Mm. And yeah, it's true that I feel always very insecure about this. Someone's going to, and people have called me out when I've made a mistake about what kind of law and so on. Um, so what I feel I do is a sociology of law. And I think that's, what you can do if you're uh, not a legal scholar. I mean, it, it, it's uh, law is not some mystery. <laughs> you know, we have to put it in its context. We have to do discourse analysis of, uh, of what is said in law. We, we have all the methodologies in sociology and anthropology, et cetera, for, for, for dealing with this. So I would just say, you know, work with the, the methodologies you have. And in fact, I, I like to think I was thinking about this. I was very troubled about choosing to do the, the killing of L'Oreal Sinigani because I thought, you know, I was worried everybody would say that's so American, we don't have that stuff over here. And, uh, and I thought, well, what I'm actually trying to talk about, because I imagine myself talking to fellow researchers, is he, here's a kind of methodology. You know, when you have this kind of shooting, 
look at look at what the police say and then contextualize everything in the history and the historical present you know of, of, of course so so I would say you know but I might sound a tad defensive because I do I do worry sometimes when I don't know enough of the law you know I remember I got thrown for a loop when somebody <laughs> a good friend actually in the audience of one of my talks in the U.S. said uh, well I don't know you keep talking about inquests we don't have those for police shootings in in the U.S. and I kept thinking oh my god what do they have they must have something and of course they have these investigations which is what I discuss in in this article but in Canada if this were happening in Canada I would be discussing the inquest. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read a comment and question from Jamie Wolf. As a use of force expert and retired law enforcement professional, I am grateful for your talk, which is spot on. Bravo for your work and for speaking to this very painful reality in the US and Canada. Laws are changing in the USA slowly, and that is only one piece. Speaking truth to what has occurred and continues is key to understanding. My question is, do you believe that law enforcement in the US is addressing these painful issues, or do you see it as hopeless? Or do you hold on to hope given the new administration and training requirements for law enforcement? That's a good question. It's an excellent question. And thank you for that comment, especially coming from your experience. Um, this I think is the abolition question, which is, you know, can you actually fix this? <laughs> and I, I don't think you can fix it with training. I'm completely, uh, I'm, I'm so clear about that. I became an academic decades ago because I used to be a human rights trainer and, and really you cannot train people around um, racism if they're in structures that are so 100% dedicated to racial disciplining. And policing is that, it's dedicated to that. So instead of reforming policing, I, I think we have to think about Black Lives Matter and, and police abolition and prison abolition. Uh, that's always very, very scary. People hear that and they say, I can't imagine it. What are you talking about? Um, and I think what we have to do is uh, discipline ourselves and study and take, take uh, you know, inspiration from the people who do this well already. What does indigenous, uh, what does police abolition and prison abolition look like in the case of indigenous peoples in Canada or in the US? What is it that you might want to have? So people have talked about why don't we get police to do other things? Um, does L'Oreal's alleged shoplifting have to be solved the way that Shipley solved it? And I'm not saying uh, an, in, uh, an individual decision here. What about this whole structure? Shipley spends his day doing this. That's what policing is in Winslow, Arizona. So training is not going to interrupt that structure. So we have to think very much about the structure and it begins with the frank acknowledgement, policing is colonial work, slave work, that is how it's organized. And if we want to organize something else, we have to think about what that something else is. Um, easy to say, I can hear you. If you ask this question, it sounds as though you're extremely thoughtful and have, have, have vast experience of this. You know, it just I have found it myself such a challenge to think about what abolition looks like. But there is one thing I know for sure. We have to think that way because nothing has stopped the deaths. Nothing has stopped the deaths. But then you get to the really uncomfortable reality that there is not a desire to stop the deaths. Mm -hmm. That I mean, and you use the term disposability, and I think about you know necropolitics, you know deliberate state policies that produce death. You know that is you know really challenges uh, Canadian naivete about the purpose of policing and uh, inequities and in social determinants of health, etc. Yeah, I, you know I, I guess I would like to take a step back and think about people's uh, desires you know, and, and, and what they want, that they, they, what are their fears? And people's fears are not their own. <laughs> fears are socially produced. What are the systems that produce these kinds of emotions that 
are connected to the kind of things like Blue Lives Matter and so on. Uh, what are they and what is it that people will not see? Um, the, the death count, I mean, you can actually, as I do work on torture as well, you can, you can show pictures, you can show footnotes, you very careful as a scholar to have 5,000 footnotes so that everyone can see it and it doesn't matter in the least because it is all about how people inhabit particular worlds and selves emotionally. And so we need to think about what it is that feeds that. What would lead uh, a police officer to think that the only recourse is to kill people right away? Where, where does that come from? You know, I, I, I think we have to ask these sort of fundamental questions. And, you know, the good news is tons of people have asked and answered these questions for a while. <laughs> and if it's anything that this uh, pandemic and the protests of, of summer have brought forward is, is to go back to all of these people who have been speaking until they're hoarse, telling us all about their analysis. So there's a lot of work on it, far better than, than, than my own. I mean, I feel like that's the work I have to think about. Like, what does abolition look like? Thank you. Madeira, I'll let you choose the next question. Yeah, I'm gonna ask, um, Valerie's question. Thank you for a great talk, Dr. Razak. You briefly mentioned an emerging discourse about persons and mental health. We know that many Indigenous Black and Brown bodies who are targeted by police do indeed live with mental health issues. Could you please elaborate on the role of this discourse for police in the law? Have you been thinking about how ableism is co-constructed through uh, colonial and racial violence? Yes, I, I thank you for that question. I want to think about that very much because um, when I left Canada, actually in 2016, they, they had, I had done a bit of work again. I don't want to, you can go look at the website, um, you know, racial violence hub and look at uh, race and deaths in custody. But there was all of this talk in uh, about um, persons in crisis. Uh, there was a report by Yakabuchi. There was all kinds of, there's a whole set of state documents that are circulating this notion. And what it really is, is to, to, to my mind, is taking a frame and plunking it on deaths in custody. So the frame is what you see here is not a violent police officer who has done absolutely the wrong thing. What you see here is a person in crisis. And the person in crisis inevitably gets constructed as having caused their own death. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that is what we have to think about, even as we do know that mental health plays a very critical role. But as I say in Dying from Improvement, I wish that we would stop dissecting indigenous bodies and minds and start dissecting white bodies and minds. As long as we're going to do any kind of dissection, we, you know, you know, dissecting, we need to do it on both sides. And doing it on both sides would mean that we have to critically look at what those kinds of concepts are doing, what kind of work they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I want to go back to um, when we were talking about the, t the Proud Boys being labeled a terrorist um, organization in Canada that was really celebrated. Um, and I saw different people kind of commenting um, that I respect. And I mean, that it, I mean, I understand what it achieves in terms of it's just you cannot, uh, I guess, use the state that is white supremacy uh, to try to dismantle white supremacy is how I see it. And, you know, as a Muslim who experienced Islamophobia and uh, as an immigrant immediately after right before 9-11, um, I just, I found it really interesting the way some people were celebrating that. Um, even people of color or like Muslims, um, you know, saying like, well, at least they're applying that label to them now and trying to ins inspect themselves and yeah. Oh gosh, well, it's, you know, you can understand the emotional thing, you know, every time there's any kind of 
um, violent act. Usually, you know, my siblings and I do what probably your siblings do, which is phone up each other quickly. Oh my God, I hope it's not a Muslim. I hope it's somebody else because you know what's going to happen. So, so one can appreciate, you know, that it's despite it's not... them being, you know, the overwhelming victims of terrorism, it, yeah. it's really strange to watch like white people it produce that fear and that white anxiety. Um, about like Islamic terrorism and whatnot. So yeah, and, and then that just transfers, um, like you mentioned, you know, there but are- What I really, really fear about this Proud Boys as a terrorist group thing is that, is that it's going to easily feed into, there are really bad whites and then there are mostly good ones. And so it, everything gets sort of localized to the extremists. Uh, so that's one, one problem. At the same time, I can't, I must tell you that I'm thinking to myself, wow, what kind of moment are we in when white terrorists can be named? You know, could, could that be a good thing? I'm not actually totally sure. Um, and I'm sure that given, um, you know, one of the things around uh, terrorism is that it's, it becomes enmeshed in, in, in kinds of exceptions in law where you can do anything to anybody suspected of involvement in terrorism. I'm curious to see whether that would work if the terrorist is white. Um, pretty sure it won't work in the same way. Um, and you can see it unfolding in the US, uh, you know, the impeachment hearings now. There's violence and there's but real violence, you know, and even though the US um, media kept saying, uh, oh, my gosh, you know, th this is white people behaving like this. This is not people of color. And that's one thing I love about the United States. Well, it was like, this is in Iraq. We're not in right. Iraq. Look at right. all the military. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, you've only the race. Been, the race thing is you've only been doing that. Yeah. <laughs> But in Canada, there, there, there might be this terrible danger of thinking, you know, it's a few isolated people and, and mostly Americans or something like that. Uh, so that's what we'll have to like think about. And you're right, it's very difficult to think about um, whether you can use the same mechanisms that are used to racially govern people um, to, to fight this way. I, I don't know. It's a very intriguing thing. And I expect we'll see it uh, unfold. Thus far, there has been um a fair amount of uh condemnation of the white you know mob um uh, but there has also been this sort of desire to well, you see it split because there were so many so-called ordinary people participating here police officers even some legislators etc uh that uh, Americans are really wondering, like, how do we understand what's happening here? Because it doesn't seem to be just Proud Boys and Three Percenters, or rather Proud Boys and Three Percenters are <laughs> regular Americans. So it is, it is a moment where one has to confront that. And uh, those of us watching, we shouldn't just be watching it, we should be trying to name how white supremacy works as a system. And, and not exceptionalize white violence, which is really what I felt I was trying to do with understanding Shipley's shooting, is that appearances notwithstanding, let us not say that he is, oh my God, I'm yeah. sorry again. Um, he, let, let us not say that his violence towards indigenous people is unique because it is institutionally supported and institutionally generated. And we need to keep our eye on that. As tempting as it is to see him as this extraordinarily hysterical <laughs> white subject with lots of guns. Um, you know, so I, I did walk that line and I, I must say that it troubles me still that I, I haven't found quite the way to, I don't want you, to, any of you to go away with the idea that this is an unusual person. This is the exact opposite. This is a very normal person who is a regular police officer doing a regular job who got off doing in all the regular ways. That's such a powerful message. Um, I'm gonna 
ask one more question from the Q&A and I'll reframe it a little bit. Um, but Rebecca starts off by saying, amazing talk. Thanks so much for sharing your analysis. Um, she's, a, they, I don't know what the pronoun, they are asking a question um, about the specific dynamics of what happens in border towns. And this makes me think about the concept of unmapping, which I know I have some students who, former students who are on this webinar, uh, they know it because I make everybody read. Uh, <laughs> The piece about the murder of Pamela George because it's such a powerful uh, piece and the, the notion of unmapping of looking at the way in which space is gendered and racialized is so foundational to policing and the law isn't it yes i i mean the as you as you've named I, I have been a bit preoccupied with space and the spatiality of violence for some time because i actually believe that it offers as a methodology for understanding the violence. So you, you, you have to think spatially, like what is the encounter that is happening in that very specific space? And what is the history of that encounter? Uh, and the key part with this, and someone you know, has asked about the, the border town, I, I wasn't even familiar with that terminology because we don't use it in Canada. Uh, a border town doesn't mean a town at the US-Mexico border. A border town means a town between the white town and an Indian reservation, which I think is very telling. Um, so what, what, what that word border town is describing is this space of encounter. And we should, we should think about that in the Pamela George piece, as you know, I, I, I tried to think about what is imagined as indigenous space into which white boys must, must go so that they can know themselves to be white. And, and that is, is how I want to think of the border town. Like what is going on there? Where are the white people? What are the white people doing? Where are the indigenous people? What are the indigenous people doing? Um, the Canadian equivalent of that, you can find an analysis of it using slightly archaic terms in the Aboriginal justice inquiry when Mr. Justice uh, Sinclair and, and, and Hamilton uh, actually uh, analyze the murder of Helen Betty Osborne. And they're faced with the fact that the town of the Palm, Manitoba knew about this murder and knew about the murderers for 20 years, no one said anything. And that there was a particular encounter going on. I've just started to write about that actually, because I find it quite remarkable what spatialities those commissioners observed in the town of Depa, Manitoba. And what they basically observed was there was an Indian town and a white town in the same space. And in this space, there was a whole lot of killing of indigenous people and, and, and women taken out to be raped and so on. It was a spatiality that's very familiar. And, and so I think, uh, you know, what I love about uh, sp spatiality, I, sort of stole a lot of it from the geographers. I really like this idea of tracking what Fanon said, which is the lines of force. I actually have one more question for you because when, when you spoke uh, in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology years ago, I remember it very well, um, it's probably, I don't think I had kids then, so I think it was like two, 2002 or 2003. Um, and you told me what I, you told me, these are the two most important things I've read lately. One was The Homeless Body by Kay Wash. Ah, oh, yes. And the other was Necropolitic, Necropolitics by Achille Mbembe, which of course, you know, I, I oh. use quite extensively. So I have to ask, you know, what are the, the pieces of work, like one or two pieces of work that you think are really important right now? Oh my gosh, <laughs> I don't know. I sometimes feel that my head is split between indigenous and, uh, you know, thinking about the Muslim, which is the book I'm, I'm finishing now, so that it would be hard to answer that question generally. Actually, what I've found uh, is that I'm going back to texts, and I realize with some embarrassment that there is a text that I mention in nearly everything I write including whether it's Muslims or indigenous. And that I actually got the book right here because I keep it here. This from 2000, it's called The National Uncanny ah. by Renee Berglund. It's called Indian Ghosts and American Subjects. And the reason why I keep going back to it is because I, 
really want to think about what is in the heads of colonizers. And so that's, you know, you keep going back to these kinds of things to find the little clues where you might. So I'm sure the minute I get off this call, I will think, you know, oh, why didn't I mention this or that? But, you know, when, when your head is sort of with a very specific problem, then you keep, you know, going back um, to, to, to what people are saying um, on that problem. And for me, it has been this thing about, which I've talked about a lot today, about the violence that results from a psyche that has so many ghosts in it and, and ghosts because of, you know, Berglund has a, a, a wonderful analysis, which is essentially the land, um, the land is haunted because it is stolen. Yes, which we should never forget. We should never forget, but then we can take that some more steps further. Who is the subject who is haunted and what is that subject haunted by? Yeah. And at the moment, for me, because I'm just at the point of finishing this book, it's it's a whole bunch of Muslim phantoms, Muslim terrorists, rapists, pedophiles. Those are in the heads, not only of Proud Boys and others, but you know, Republican. full on politicians and everyday yes. people. Yes. So, uh, I'll let you know if I have a better answer. <laughs> and I, I I will appreciate it. Um, and a lot of my students in the future will end up reading it. So they may be happy or not, but in any event, I can't thank you enough for speaking to us today and for this wonderful conversation. Again, I, I think that the, the example that you uh, provide with your scholarship of absolutely meticulous research and the refusal to let us look away from the, the violence and the profound inequality that structures our daily lives, whether we're experiencing it or not. I think that's such a powerful model for sociology and anthropology students and faculty members and uh, people who are interested in the world at all. So thank you so much. I wish thank you, you very much. I wish you the absolute very best. And I hope that I run into you at a conference again in Hawaii or someplace. You think those things will happen again? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so, but I can dream. Yeah. I that. Thank you so much. Thanks again. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you.